some water. Well, hello, everyone. Um, not that it matters all that much, but I'm Stephen Worles. I teach in the political science department, and I'm the uh, associate director of the project for the study of liberal democracy. I want to thank the many sponsors of this event, but with special appreciation for the generosity of the Institute for Humane Studies and the Jack Miller Center, both of which organizations have done great good work in educating students and faculty and citizens about the Constitution. Speaking of which, this is Constitution Day which recognizes the anniversary of the signing of the Constitutional Plan in Philadelphia. It still needed to be ratified, and you heard it here first, it was. So the topic for today is the freedom of speech, which was established as a civil right by the First Amendment, and is a cornerstone of a healthy liberal democracy. It has, in other words, a distinctly political character. The more specific topic is freedom of speech on college campuses. And the question is whether and how it is a cornerstone of a healthy academic life. It has a rationale that is distinctly not political, but it has become entangled in politics, which is why we are here today. Our speaker this afternoon is Jonathan Rausch, currently associate editor, at associate, sorry, senior scholar with the Brookings Institute and contributing editor of the Atlantic at the Atlantic Monthly. He's he has many books and articles, and the list is just too long. But I do have a few things to say about him. He is very hard to pigeonhole. He seems to be both a liberal and a conservative, and sometimes in the same sentence. So his, he, he's, he's always worth reading, and particularly because he takes on very difficult topics and always appeals to our reason in trying to explain them. We will take questions live if you want after the talk. Um, but if you choose, if you're shy and you'd rather write one down, write it down. We'll collect it and read it out from here. But please welcome Jonathan Rauch. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Cullen of the Political Science Department. And I remember 25 years ago, Jonathan Rauch published Kindly Inquisitors. I assigned it in one of my courses. 20 students bought that book. Imagine the royalties <laughs> you, got, you got from that. I think you made I no money. I think it's up to about 40 now. Yeah. Uh, I think you made no money on that book. Uh, you, you said I one literally time, made so, no money on that book. Right. But the second edition, uh, we'll talk about that Hope in, springs a, eternal. in a minute. But 25 years ago, most people in the, in the room Weren't, weren't born yet, and I want to ask you to share with, share with them what prompted you to write that book at that time. In 1989, when I was 28 years old, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the ruler of Iran, issued a death sentence against Salman Rushdie, a novelist, for writing a book that the Ayatollah found blasphemous and deeply offensive, as did Muslims around the world. And in fact, if you read the Satanic Verses, you know that it was, in fact, deeply offensive to Muslims. That was part of the story of the book. I was astonished as a naive 28-year-old at the weakness of the response from the West. People said, well, it's not good to order the murder of someone, but on the other hand, the book itself was very offensive. What did he expect and so forth? And that motivated me to start thinking about attacks on 
freedom of speech, and more broadly the system we have for making knowledge, which depends on criticism, which means it depends on giving offense. And that became the birth of Kindly Inquisitors. It's not a book actually about college free speech, and still isn't, but it happened to come along at just at the moment when the first wave of kind of social angst about political correctness was hitting. So it proved to be very timely, and alas, is still very timely. Right. So the subtitle of the book is The, the New Attacks on Free Thought. You've said, you've said a little bit about what the threats were 25 years ago. You published the second edition 20 years later. Big changes in, in the world, big changes in technology. There was no Facebook, no Twitter, no iPhones when you wrote the book originally. Social media has changed the way we, we interact. We said we, we live on the screen. What, what did those new circumstances mean for the practice of free speech and our That's thoughts a, about what the principles of it's free a, speech It's a great question. It's a big question. Um, so there's a big chunk of a response here. Um, start looking restless in your chair if this goes on for too long. Or I know I can count on our audience to do that. The book identifies a handful of what I thought were core threats to what I call liberal science, which is the system in which a free society makes knowledge, that is, distinguishes fact, knowledge, from opinion and belief. And it said there were three of those, the two which are still mostly relevant are what I call the egalitarian challenge and the humanitarian challenge. The egalitarian challenge said liberal science isn't fair because it privileges, scientists tend to be white, they tend to be male, you know, uh, the Western canon and all that. It said Afrocentrists should have a place in the sun or another version of this was creationist. Creationism should be taught in the schools. That's only fair, it's equal time. Uh, I believe that using politics to shoehorn ideas into the canon was a fundamental attack on the core idea of science, which is ideas only become knowledge by withstanding a public critical process, which those other ideas had not done. The second attack I call the humanitarian challenge. And that's the idea that if you hurt people with words, you're violating their rights. And it's more than just giving offense. It's words that wound. People were saying um, that these racist words were a form of violence. And I argued that although this is well-intentioned, it is completely and totally incompatible with making knowledge in a free society because the whole point of criticism is that it stings, often very bitterly. It's often very unkind, even in the sciences, to say much less of something like journalism. Um, and then it turned out that, for example, the very first federal speech code case University of Michigan was because a student said in the classroom discussion he thought homosexuality is a disease that's treatable with therapy. Someone reported this and said this is outrageous and deeply offensive and hurts me. As a gay man, I was horrified by this form of discipline because the only way you can deal with that kind of conception is by floating it and knocking it down, showing that this is wrong, not trying to ban the words. So. Fast forward, um, what's changed? Not the substance. We don't see much of the egalitarian threat. We don't see much of the Afrocentrism or the separatist kind of feminist knowledge that we were seeing. But the humanitarian challenge is still there big time and in some ways more than ever. Uh, this is the idea that if I hear things which are fundamentally not only offensive, but make me feel like a second-class citizen or make me feel marginal, marginalized or make me feel unsafe, that I'm owed redress for that. I'm owed protection for that. Uh, a fundamentally anti-intellectual, anti-scientific holding. The form has changed somewhat, and we can talk about this. It's, I'm not sure it's all that important, but it's, I think, a less an ideological tack now in some ways, and it's more coming from kind of student affairs bureaucrats. And now from students themselves, a lot of students seem to feel they want to have a safe space on campus, whether it's called that or something else. Um, It'll be interesting to hear from yeah. students themselves about that. 
Yeah, and, and there's a debate about, uh, about whether, to what extent, that's really true. Uh, I think, in fact, most students are not snowflakes. Um, but the notion that we should be protected and that we're second minorities, people like me, I'm three kinds of oppressed minority or historically oppressed minority, Jewish, homosexual, and atheist, um, that people like me need to be protected from hurtful or hateful or offensive speech is exactly backwards. Uh, we need it. We need to find out where these ideas are so that they can be countered and remedied. Yeah. So two, two points of clarification. When, when you use the term liberal science, you're not using it in any political sense. You're not contrasting Correct. it with conservative science. Yeah, I mean it's, in the sense of, of liberal democracy, right. you know, a system of decentralized rules, basically a network approach. Right. And a, Above all, you, you seem to emphasize a, a process, and, right. and, and we'll come back to that process. Right. Impersonal later. rules instead of authoritarian rule. Right. Yeah. And on the second point, on the, on the concern for using, using regulations and using discipline, and at the ultimate level, using laws to spare people um, wounds, you're not denying the wounds. You're not denying Correct. the the hurt. You're not Correct. saying words can't can't hurt you. That's a misinterpretation. You're, Correct. you're saying no, but this is a this is a hurt. To put it bluntly, that you must suffer for the sake of this larger framework of knowledge knowledge creation. Is that is that a fair way to put it? That's that's two thirds of the way fair. Um, the part that's fair is in liberal society. If we care about knowledge and freedom, and yes, peace, because peace comes from not having to have wars over central authorities who decide what we can say, mm -hmm. then we have a positive moral obligation to be thick-skinned, um, and that's also where knowledge comes from. And I also believe I've lived through this as a same-sex marriage advocate, saying stuff for years that was seen as crazy, if not um, hurtful and offensive. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought we were trying to undermine the core institution of American life. Um, it's essential for minorities, for our own sake, uh, to hear this stuff in order to strengthen ourselves and confront it. So it's good for us. The, the one third of that that I would disagree with is this idea that words have this intrinsic power to wound. If I were, for example, to call you a fucking faggot in Swahili, you would not be wounded by that. Um, so, use of words is transactional. We have some ability as audiences and as hearers to decide how to receive the words. So when someone calls me a fucking faggot, um, they actually recently called me something worse, because they added the, the n-word, which I didn't really understand, but one way to interpret that is as something deeply wounding and marginalizing, but another way to interpret that is as sounds made by a human being wearing a sign around the neck that says, I am an idiot. Mm -hmm. And I have, there's an element of choice in how we choose to approach these situations where sure, it's never going to be fun to be threatened um, or to be challenged intellectually, but we can make decisions about whether to treat that as an opportunity to educate somebody um, or to see this person as just a fool rather than to decide to escalate. Yeah. So it's, it's often said, uh, especially, especially these days, that to take your, uh, your formulation, we have to endure these, these um, disgraceful assaults on our, our dignity. But it's, it's argued the we is, it turns out, is vulnerable minorities. Um, it's not everybody. And there's an argument that that special burden is disproportionate. Only, only part of the public is paying the cost of, of free speech, so to speak. Um, you, you've just, I think, replied to that objection by saying especially minorities need to need to learn to respond that way but what about the argument that to put it one way aren't aren't you asking 
people to be heroic. And we're not asking the entire public to be heroic because, again, the burdens fall disproportionately on folks like you. Again, I'll, I'll two-thirds agree with that. <clears throat> the third disagreement is that most of us, whatever our race, color, gender, mm -hmm. um, and so forth, encounter deeply offensive ideas. And if you're, for example, an evangelical Christian in this country, um, you're probably feeling a lot of the time deeply disrespected. And you may, for that reason, be voting for Donald Trump. Um, you may feel offended a whole lot of the time and in a very deep way. And you may even feel that if Hillary Clinton wins the 2016 election, you won't be able to practice your religion freely in this country in two years, which is crazy. Um, but this is not a feeling, this sense of marginalization and being under attack, being unsafe, is not a feeling that minorities have a monopoly on. So that's the one-third reservation. Mm -hmm. The two-thirds of that, which I think are important, is right, is, yeah, being a minority in a majoritarian society anywhere in the world imposes a kind of tax. It's not an impossible burden. It's not an unmeetable burden. But it means that people like me, when 20 years ago, you know, we were forbidden to get married, right? right. Um, 20 years ago, we were still arrested in our homes or menaced with arrest in our homes for the crime of making love. And we had to suffer the indignity of going around saying, you know, knocking on doors saying, please, Mr. Straight Person, can't I get married too, pretty please? Please, Mr. Straight Person, do I really have to go to jail for this? Um, the pulpits every day were, you know, not so much 20 years ago, but certainly 40 years ago when I was growing up, were, were an onslaught of hate speech against gay people. That's an extreme example, but the truth is if you're Jewish or atheist or gay, there is this tax of having to go around every day and explain yourself. You're going to seem esoteric and a curiosity at best, and you're going to seem alien and maybe even threatening at worst. But here's the thing about that. The only way out is through. And what I try to remind people again and again is that being a minority in a majoritarian society, provided it's a free society, one where you can have your say, is a burden, but it's also a privilege. Minorities, people like me, are the canaries in the coal mine. We're the first to spot the injustices. You get a better view of society from the margins than from right in the middle. Where the moral leaders of society, where the people at the vanguard, the people able to make change, to raise consciousness, to educate. So yeah, it's a burden, but it's also a privilege. And regardless of what you think it is, it's also inevitable. It is not possible for minorities in society to simply pass a law mm -hmm. and gain acceptance. Right, that's a, that's a point you make emphatically in the book. And in the case of, of gay rights and marriage equality, you say, look, this, this scheme actually worked. Progress was, was possible. But when you come back to the, to the larger point, the, the framework of, of liberal science, as you, as you call it, the, um, it seems to be predicated on the idea that Freedom, freedom of, of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of communication broadly is subordinate to the truth function. That that's why we should care about freedom. It's, it's the pathway to, to truth. And, but again, many people will object if truth is what we're ostensibly after, what contribution would an Alex Jones make to this process? Um, it's, isn't it actually a, a violation of the rules of the game of, of liberal science to include under the expression of protection someone who isn't interested in truth, doesn't submit to, to the discipline of rational argument and, and so on? Is, is your point that, look, you, you can't have the system unless 
every, in, unless it covers everybody, because we just can't make these kinds of distinctions? Or is it the more, the more interesting, and perhaps, um, I'm not sure if it's more radical or not, but the more interesting point that even those extremists, even those outliers, actually, and perhaps against their will, against their consciousness, play a role in the truth-serving can I process. Can I say all of the above? Well, um, I hate that one. Can I... Yeah, isn't it fun when you ask a long question and the answer I mean, I was, I was stuck yes. at 66% for the <laughs> longest time, though, so I'll, 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 take, I'll take the complete So, guess. yeah, so, so all of the above, um, there's an important liberty interest in freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And we don't need to get into all the reasons why. Uh, everyone in this room either has or should read John Stuart Mill, and you'll get that. But there's more to it than that. My thinking on this, my book, my contribution, I think, to the extent I made one, is I'm not just writing about freedom of speech. I'm writing about discipline of knowledge. On the other side of the same coin, the responsibility that goes along with the right is if you care about knowledge and about truth, and also, by the way, about freedom and peace, about making knowledge peaceably instead of the usual way, which is if someone disagrees with you, you burn them at the stake. Um, the standard human method for until about 400 years ago. Yeah, worked for a long time. Yeah, it worked for a long time, unless you were burned at the stake. Yeah. It also meant society was at a perpetual state of oppression, war, and that knowledge didn't advance. If you care about those things, then there are obligations that go with this. And some of those obligations are, you can say and believe anything you want, but if you want your beliefs to be accepted as knowledge and respected, if you want them to be taught in textbooks, if you want them to drive the research agenda, um, studied, footnoted, used as the basis for policy making, treated as real instead of as crazy, then there's some things you have to do. You have to submit your beliefs to other people for checking, and checking is going to be a withering process, um, and it can go on for years. And until you get through that process, you're just a person with an opinion. So how does that work? The genius of this system is, you all know who Alex Jones is, he's this professional conspiracy theorist, who says and does cra crazy things um, for various reasons. Historically, the way we dealt with that was marginalization, something liberal science is very good at, and universities like this one are very good at, is saying, well, you can be a crazy conspiracy theorist, and no one will, you won't go to jail, and you won't be burned at the stake which, by the way, is a fantastic historical innovation. But on the other hand, you won't be welcome here. We won't be teaching this garbage. Uh, you'll never be an adjunct professor. And you're just made irrelevant. No one even bothers with you until the very recent past. And that turns out to be extremely effective. The best thing you can do about obnoxious, crazy sociopaths is ignore them. They're always out there. and. We don't hear much from them most of the time. What changes, of course, today, technology makes it very easy for them to distribute the stuff that they're doing. And that's a new kind of challenge. It's not a free speech challenge. It's, as Eugene Volokh puts it, a cheap speech challenge. How do you keep the screens up? How do you keep the discipline when it's just as easy to get on TV or the Internet and say all this stuff? And a lot of people will think it's true. Right, so yeah, you, you just anticipated my, uh, my next question and, and killed, killed the buzz now, which, which was going to be, well, two things. One, it's not a great gig to be an adjunct professor. Uh, everybody would, right. would tell you that. Right, and that's you can't even be right. an adjunct yeah. professor yeah. if you're Alex Jones. Well, well put. But, of course, he, ha he has no desire to, and, he, and he, won't, he wouldn't ever get published in the Journal of Politics or the American Political Science Review, but... He can self-publish, and isn't isn't that one of those new things that has upset the apple cart of liberal science? Because the vetting doesn't doesn't take place, and of course the the news now is that Alex Jones has been kicked off Twitter and Facebook. I'm not sure if he's in only a timeout or whether this is is permanent. 
there are a number of questions here, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the First Amendment doesn't apply to Facebook and, and Twitter. They're not governmental entities. And should it, in a, in a, in a sense, should Alex Jones be, be able to have his, uh, his voice heard on, on those platforms? Relatedly, what do you think about the power that those platforms have now to police speech for the sake of community standards? As they say, I learned recently, Facebook has a deletion center where thousands of, of people toil away with, with algorithms to figure out what, what will violate community standards and, and nip it in the bud. That's, that's really uncharted territory for us, isn't it? And I'm wondering, we, how does that bear on the, on the fate of the, the, yeah. the very paradigm of liberal science? Why don't you ask some large encompassing questions? I'm tired of that's this what we do. small ball here. Um, so the first thing to say about that large bundle of stuff is you guys out there are living at a world historical moment, possibly the biggest disruption in information technology since the invention of the printing press. We're now dealing suddenly with fundamental issues which last came up 400 years ago because when the printing press came along suddenly it was being used to spread what we would now call fake news, accusations of witchcraft all over the world and this caused upheavals in lots of societies and lots of respectable people said, oh my god, this technology is terrible because we can't control all the crazy stuff that's getting out there. And they were dealing with this. It took them a hundred years to work their way through it. We're hoping it doesn't take us a hundred years. But you guys in this hall right now, your generation, you're going to be writing the rules that addresses these problems because those rules do not currently exist. And this is crucially important de novo stuff. I, I can't overemphasize that this really is an inflection point in history and it is the people in this room who are going to make a lot of these decisions. So I'll push back a little and say that the two big subjects you raise are in fact not very closely related at all. One is the question of Facebook um, being effectively a monopoly. And that's a question I worry about that, um, but I think that's more a question of the economics of the internet and questions like what do you do about who does data belong to? And I don't feel competent to address all of those. I'd like to live in a world where people had more property rights over their data and it was easier to port it around and harder for people like Facebook to use it without their consent and monetize it without their consent. But that's another conversation. The first question you raised, so how should we think about Facebook kicking off Alex Jones, or for that matter, Jonathan Rauch, if it chooses to do so? Well, that's a question of what do we think Facebook is. When Facebook started, it kind of thought it was a dumb pipe. It was just a platform. It was completely neutral. So it was like a bulletin board. People could say anything they wanted to. If that's what you think Facebook is, then it probably should not be taking people off because of what they say, any more than the phone company should be kicking off your phone calls because it doesn't like you know, what you're talking about. But I think there's been an inflection point. In fact, I know there has been because Mark Zuckerberg says there has been. Facebook <laughs> isn't that anymore. Facebook clearly makes a lot of choices about content. It does some of those algorithmically, it does some of those as human beings. So recently, Facebook and Google have both, both made decisions which are of historic import and I think are correct decisions, though you or some of you may disagree. They have decided if they're going to be in the business of promoting some stuff and demoting others, that they have some responsibility to the idea of truth and objective reality. They didn't need to do that. Zuckerberg could have just said, you know what? If it sells, if it gets clicks, we're promoting it. Screw you if you don't like it. But he didn't. Neither did Google. They are now demoting fake news. Um, I think that's the right decision. What we're trying to do, though, in the big picture is look for ways to reestablish some kind of social gatekeeping 
that privileges ideas and opinions that have been through the process of checking to distinguish knowledge from non-knowledge, right? It's, this is the fundamental problem of epistemology, social epistemology for 500 years. And that's why this moment is so important. We're now trying to have, figure out how to do that in these completely uncharted waters. And right. do I have the answer? No. So let's come, let's come back to what I think is the fundamental concern of, of most people who are interested in this, in this topic today. And that is what to do about hate speech. It's, it's just about a year after Charlottesville the neo-Nazis marching across the UVA campus with their torches, chanting, Jews will not replace us. Again, there's this, there's this point made by uh, critics that it's not an idea that's being expressed. So the loss to liberal science of, of not having that is is nil. And it's, it's, also, it's also argued that, look, countries like Canada, the UK, have anti-hate speech legislation. They remain democracies. They, they believe in the paradigm of, of liberal science. You're, you're not persuaded by that, by that argument. Um, but doesn't, is, isn't there a dis, an important distinction between expression that could in some way be massaged into a propositional form and expression that is, as the critics would say, really more like an act rather than a belief or an opinion or a thought at all, which, which brings us full square to this claim that really what's, what's at stake in the regulation or the suppress, suppression of hate speech is not, is not fundamentally the suppression of ideas. It's the, it's the, to put it positively, it's the protection of equal rights, equal social standing, or it's the suppression of uh, an illegal act of subordination, racial subordination, sexual subordination. Just to clarify our terms, this is a trick question, everyone. What exactly do you mean by hate speech? It's the, the kind of speech that conveys the message, the world is better off without you, that you represent some sort of, of threat, you know, to take the, the Nazi example, that your, your social group is the, is the equivalent of a bacillus that society should, should rid itself of. In other words, the, the communication of a, of a threat, the expression would be if you were going to cash it out, you know, you should die. The sooner, sooner the better. That's at least that's so, the that's the argument that's that's made. That what we're hearing are are threats, not crazy propositions that could be somehow disputed yeah, if yeah. we just had thirty minutes to really well, that, work it out. That's clarifying, partly because it's a carefully narrowed down answer. Mm -hmm. um, what about, for example? Um, homosexuality is intrinsically disordered, which implies that in a properly ordered world, homosexuals should not exist. Hate speech? How about that, everyone? Homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. Raise your hand if you think that would qualify as hate speech. Don't be shy. OK, raise your hand. That sound too like about, what, a third, maybe, or a quarter? A lot of people are probably not voting. But let's see. And they do that how many the people, um, how many, did I say that would or would not in the first question? I have no short term memory. I think you said would. Okay, let's do it again. Raise your hands if you think that that would qualify as hate speech. Homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. Okay, raise your hand if you think that would not qualify as hate speech. 
A few more hands. Raise your hands if you don't know or have no opinion. So we're about a third, a third, a third. You, you see the problem here, right? Does anyone know where the statement that I just cited comes from? Does that ring any bells? Sir? Uh, was it Justice Scalia's dissent in Oprah? It, it may have been, but why was it in his dissent? Where did he get it from? Sorry? No, the, the answer is diagnostic and statistical manual. Good guess because they define homosexuality as a, um, as a mental illness until 1973. No, that's from the Catholic Catechism. That is mainstream Catholic doctrine right now under Pope Francis. Um, homosexuality is unnatural and intrinsically disordered. Well, we in this room can't agree on whether that's hate speech. We probably can't agree on whether that is a fundamental threat to a class of people to turn them into second class citizens. I grant you there are cases that are so outrageous, like Hitler should have finished the job, that it's very hard to make any case for them. But the people who say things like that are self-marginalizing. The best thing to do, I think, about neo-Nazis who show up in Lafayette Park when there are 20 of them is ignore them because all they're trying to do is trigger you to get attention. The bigger problem is with these ideas about hate speech is what do you do with, say, Charles Murray? Um, we have an expert on that situation. You're about to hear from her in the room. So Charles Murray is a guy who wrote a book. I'm not going to try to get into it all. But the arguments over race and intelligence, and he waded into those waters and said some extremely controversial things. Some people say that this is the epitome of hate speech because it defines a whole group as basically mentally inferior based on race. What could be more obvious than that? Another group says, no, actually, the data are the data. You have to deal with the data. You're not saying anything about the relative value of human beings. Back and forth it goes. So it turns out when you so much as blow on any of these definitions, hate speeches, they turn out to need interpretation, which means you're going to have to go to some tribunal or authority to make a ruling, which means someone's now in the position of deciding what you and I can say. And it turns out, including in the countries you cited, Britain, Canada, Germany, and so forth, most countries do have hate speech laws, and those laws often wind up being used against the minorities that they're intended to protect, because that's what happens in majoritarian societies. Um, and it also turns out that college administrators turn out not to be very good, actually, at deciding who needs to be protected from what. For all of those reasons, I think that the best way to deal with hate speech is to first ignore it, and second, if you have to, debate it. When you debate it, it tends to fall apart because it's ridiculous. To go back to a point you made earlier, which I didn't really follow up on, but it's very important, this kind of radical notion. Maybe having hate speech actually helps minorities. I think that's quite true. Any of you heard of Fred Phelps and the Westboro, Westboro Baptist, Baptist Church? Does anyone know some nods? Yeah, some heads are nodding. So this was a crazy person and his kids and a small so-called congregation, kind of a cult, based in Kansas that would go around picketing the funerals of service members with signs that says, God hates faggots. I mean, the most absolutely outrageous sociopathic hate speech you could imagine. And I used to say when this was going on, you know, as a gay rights activist, I wonder, maybe the human rights campaign is paying these people to do this. <laughs> Because they were doing such a good job by being so sinister and brutal and un ugly of elevating our message, which was a message of equality and love and hope. These guys, every time they open their mouths, they make themselves a little bit weaker and ourselves a little bit stronger. Yeah. The philosopher Bernard Williams made this interesting point that it's just a curiosity that people who engage in hate speech, seem to feel the need to come up with some pseudoscientific foundation for it, you know, the bizarre racial inferiority theories of the, of the Nazis, as though they somehow understood that you, you can't just 
put hate out there naked. It has to be dressed up in some sort of ideational form. And yeah. You're saying that's that's the that's the weakness. That's the thing that can yeah. Be it falls exposed. apart under critical yeah. examination. I mean, as you say, there are, for example, hugely elaborate theories on the inferiority of blacks in America and why they were too childish to ever be able to vote or to participate. And I was just at the Civil Rights Museum this morning, which is a monument of how these things fall apart when they're put to the lie by someone like Martin Luther King, who comes forward and, and challenges them. So, yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, their theories are bad, but the other thing they need, they'll often try to concoct a theory to sound respectable, but the other thing they need is voice, these haters, right? Now, most people in America don't get up every morning looking for ways to be hateful. Um, most haters are fearful at heart. They think their way of life is in jeopardy. That's what they thought about gay people. It's what they thought about witches. These people are destroying the foundation of my family or my society or my mental health or whatever it is. The way you deal with that kind of hate is not to try to abolish the words. You don't make war on the words because that's like trying to stop global warming by breaking all the thermometers. What you have to do is you have to go after the sources of the fear and the hate, which are the misconceptions. People thought same-sex marriage was literally going to destroy families across the country. We had to prove that that wasn't so. It was a false proposition. And because we live in this society where we get to knock this stuff down, hear it, and respond to it, we prevailed. It took a little while, but historically, yeah. fantastically fast. Yeah. So we haven't, we haven't said... Uh, much about the campus, and before we we turn to the audience for some comments, l let me just uh, ask you about it. Do the arguments that you've just elaborated transfer to the campus situation pretty much whole, or would you would you want to make some? special modifications to them. One would think the college campus is the place where liberal science should be, should be practiced, so that's the, that's the answer. But the public realm is not the same as the private realm. As you mentioned, Alex Jones is not going to be teaching at Rhodes College even as an adjunct professor. Even as an adjunct? Well, what about night classes? We don't do night classes, well, okay. nor early morning classes. We have a sweet spot. The, the student body operates between 11 to 2. Yeah. Um, campuses are a little bit complicated. At the end of the day, I think the first thing you said is basically right. There's universities wear a bunch of different hats. They're doing multiple things simultaneously. One of the things they're doing is socializing young people, teaching them how to have good study habits, how to get along with others, how to be courteous and kind. We used to have finishing schools for that, but now we've transferred a lot of that to universities, and that makes it pretty important that you set some community standards and norms for how to behave to each other, and it's legitimate to do that. Um, Another thing campuses now are is a residential community. This is the point that the student was making in the Yale Silliman Courtyard in the now famous Silliman Courtyard tape. Have any home. of you seen that two or three years ago? So you probably, some of you have seen that. <clears throat> so she's hysterical and impolite and, and all of that. But she makes the point, hey, I live here. I mean, I have to walk through this place to get to my house, so should I be subjected to stuff like this? You can say it's all about, you know, the, the great combat of ideas, but I have to pass it on the way to my dorm room. So there's this residential community, and that also complicates things. And then there's the fact that it's young people, so it's in loco parentis to some extent. So all of those things factor in it, and I don't envy the job of a modern university administrator. And there's another thing that enters into it, which makes me envy it even less, which is now we're telling, we're marketing college as a Disney cruise. It's going to be the best four years of your life. We're not saying in the catalog, come here in order to have all your ideas rigorously challenged so that you can um, feel what it's like to be really upset about, about challenging ideas. Right. 
So all of that makes it complicated. Yet there is this other thing universities have always done that makes them special in society, and that is find truth. Universities, there are other truth-seeking institutions in our society, the courts, law enforcement when it works. Um, but universities are the fundamental repository of the truth-seeking endeavor and of training people who come through here in the rules of truth-seeking. And those are the rules we've been talking about. They include freedom of expression, but they also include the discipline of knowledge, subjecting yourself to harsh and unpleasant criticism. At the end of the day, if universities are not doing that, then we don't need universities. If on occasion, around the margins, they need to enforce some basic norms of decency, okay. But they need to do that in ways that distinguish, for example, between the frat boys on the bus doing the awful stuff that they were doing, whatever it was, and Charles Murray, a guy making a controversial intellectual proposition. If they can't make that distinction, then we can't allow them to make distinctions. There was a headline a couple of years ago from The Onion, which students, students know, which ran college, great place to explore idea. And um, <laughs> that, that was one, one take on the problem. So I, wa I want to end with this, John. You're, you're, a, you're a really nice guy. This is a very tough book. And here's one of the tough passages. He doesn't mean tough to read. No, it's I know. It's really fun to read. It reads like a novel. You can't put it down. And it's only, I think, twelve ninety nine on Amazon. It's, it's, a give, it's a steal. It's a steal. And he, he, is a, he is a beautiful writer. Yes, I am. Um, yes, I am. But now, now, the, now the harsh part. You, said, you say in the book, the attempt to equate criticism with violence is an attempt to muzzle people your side disagrees with. Stop it. Don't do that. And then you, you offer this as the, the bracing statement of, of principle, quote, no one is allowed the right to end any debate or to claim special control over it or exemption from it. No one under any circumstances is exempt from criticism of any kind, however unpleasant. No one will be punished for the beliefs he holds or the opinions he states because to believe incorrectly is never a crime. I'm not sure that college ad administrators who came up a moment ago would, would accept that, that principle, but you, you are emphatic about it. And again, it, it seems to emphasize debate, criticism, beliefs, all of those things that are yeah. part and parcel of, of liberal science, and yet there's this, this opposing view that keeps insisting there's something else besides beliefs that's going on here. Do we have to protect that too? Can't we, can't we balance the concerns for free expression that liberal science depends on with compassionate inclusivity, to use the, the phrase that the Middlebury students invoked. The norms of liberal science are the world's most inclusive, by far, for just the reasons you name. They say that anyone can question any proposition at any time. They may be ignored if I run around with the proposition that silent radio controls my mind. Um, or, for that matter, that the inaugural crowd was bigger for Trump than Obama, I'll be ignored or ridiculed, and I'll deserve to be. That's how that's dealt with. <clears throat> but I'll be able to say those things, and I'll be able to be heard. That's inclusive. In practice, it turns out that, like all authorities who were asked to make all of these fine distinctions about what you can and cannot say under various circumstances, university officials are not very well equipped to do that. And in fact, they'll often make some really terrible decisions. And the better idea is to let the community figure that out by talking it over in ways that, yeah, may be unpleasant, 
but we'll allow that debate to continue. So that's, that's a practical objection. Authorities don't do this well. The history of efforts to regulate conversation and debate have been abysmal. Um, going back to the beginning, you know, when the U.S. government decided to go after obscenity, which, you know, you'd think would be fairly easy, the first thing they did was impound and burn all copies of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses. Um, when they went after um, lesbian obscenity, the first thing they did was shut down an issue of a gay literary magazine in the 50s whose cover article, which they were censoring, was called You Can't Say That, a criticism of government censorship. So this is what happens, right, in practice. That's the in principle answer, uh, in practice answer. Here's the in principle answer. In the phrase that you just read, I said, believing incorrectly is never a crime. I didn't say believing in incorrectly is never stupid. I didn't say it's never offensive, and I certainly never said you should do it. Um, but I did say it's never a crime. And that means where we ought to draw the line as a community is trying to punish people in systematic and formal or often informal ways for incorrect belief. Right. That's where the line should be drawn. Ostracism, okay. Silent protest, okay. If Charles Murray comes and speaks and you have a counter, counter speaker somewhere else, or maybe you silently turn your back, okay in most cases. But when you physically interfere with a speaker, when you shut down the ability of other students to hear what that person has to say, when you use violence against them, or when an administration uses force to shut them down, that's when you've compromised the fundamental principles, I think, of a university. I'm not saying all these cases are easy in every single situation. Well, I, I did my best to subject your very persuasive book to a stress Withering test. Criticism. Let's, uh, let's see if members of the audience have some questions about things that may have been overlooked. Thank you. That is such an important question. Um, Let's just repeat the gist of it in case. Yeah, how, does the, how do the free speech arguments change when they go from censorship or speech codes by administrators to speech regulation by student bodies, student organizations? Can I slightly reinterpret that in question and make it broader? So here's what I think has happened. I think Professor Cullen, to some extent, disagrees. When I got into all this 25 years ago, there was a focused ideological attack coming from certain quarters of academia on the whole concept of free speech and liberal science, because it was oppressive, white, hegemonic, and so forth. What I'm seeing now from students and campuses and what I'm hearing about from my friends who do this for a living is that what we're seeing now is coming much more from the bottom up than it used to. It's students demanding protection of various forms from stuff that they find offensive. And often what I'm hearing is students saying that the classroom and professors are more providing a safe harbor for controversial conversation than they can have outside the classroom because the students are afraid of getting hit with the social media campaigns, the size, the eye rolling, the ostracism, so that the student demand for this stuff is stronger. That's a harder problem to deal with. I don't know about student organizations, per se. And we can certainly hear, say that we're not, for the most part, talking about First Amendment territory here, because this isn't government activity. But what we're talking about is, is what do you do if a lot of students feel like you know, if they encounter an idea or a speech or a thought that's obnoxious and hurtful, that the first thing to do is go to the administration, file a complaint, and shut that down. 
Well, that's a tougher kind of problem. And the truth is, I don't know what to do about that, but it's part of the reason I'm here. Um, I, I do, it may surprise you to know that I do favor a bias incident reporting system. Do you have one here? Mm -hmm. So have any of you used the bias incident reporting system? Anybody at all? No one? Is that people being shy or is it not used that much? We don't know, actually, because we, we haven't yet had a report about the results of it. You know, oh, we're we're well. quite eager to, to hear. To see yeah. how it's used and whether it's used? Yeah. Um, I have a bias incident reporting system, which I favor, which is if you think there's something wrong with me, say because I'm gay, or because I say stupid things in class or out of class, I want that bias incident reported then and there to me. And I will defend it. I will push back. That's a better bias incident reporting system. I think we have time for one more Question yeah, I'm sorry I didn't really have an answer to the first one because we're still figuring out how to deal with this. There's a new book about this, by the way, which is really good. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, and it, it looks at the habits of mind that are beginning to encroach in this area. I'm sorry. Yeah. Elliot? Yeah, that dovetails with the previous question. The question is, is it possible that chilling speech is doing more harm than banning speech? And I think on campuses today, the answer is unequivocally yeah. The worst of the campus speech codes, the bans on speech, were struck down in court, or a lot of them were shamed out of existence. There's still a bunch of them on the books. But people being brought up on charges for saying things they're not allowed to say is still pretty rare and, and not all that important. What's not rare is the sense that you will be an object of um, social censure if you talk in unapproved ways about certain subjects. An example of that, I hear a lot of this, but I talked recently to a Princeton graduate, very outspoken, as you can imagine, extremely bright guy who said, as outspoken as he was, he would not have any conversations on campus with anyone on the subject of race or gender. And I said, why not? And he said, because it's all downside. When I talk to students, I hear that a lot, and the attitude is kind of, well, we can, we'll just, I, can, I can get through four years and, and just avoid controversy on these subjects because it's just too risky to talk about. Well, when stuff gets too risky to talk about, then that means we're not having honest conversations anymore. We're not doing a job at our universities. And also, I think we're creating Trump voters because they're well aware that whole items of the conversation are being pushed off limits and being stigmatized. And yeah, that's, this is the thing I don't yet have the answer to. If the problem is not coming from legal bans, but if it's coming from the culture of the campus, if it's like the 50s on college campuses, except kind of a more left-wing version of the 50s, how do we change the culture on campus? And that's why people ask me about this, and I kind of say it's going to be up to the people in this room to figure it out. But that's a real challenge. Well, we are going to start figuring that out in just a few minutes in the next session. So I hope you will all stay for that. And let's thank John Rauch. His new book, by the way. Thank you. I stepped on, I stepped on your applause trying to make a crass commercial announcement that your new book is, is called The Happiness Curve, 
why life gets better after yeah. 50. It's, it's a very positive book, obviously. The bad news is apparently you have to wait until 50. <laughs> um, Thank you. Please, it's a, it's been it. a privilege to be here. We'll Thank have you, you all. back. <laughs>